apologies for the light episode. Uh, I have been sick for the better part of a month, and I don't know if you can tell, I'm still mildly sick, doing a lot better. I'm not coughing up a lung every time I speak. In fact, I think this is the longest I've been able to speak for a month and a half, and uh, Red was also a bit under the weather, so yeah, apologies, but we're doing better now, and yeah. <laughs> yeah, we don't have any substitutes to call in when we're sick. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Marxism Day. I'm Tony Schmidt. And I am Red Wagner. And today, tonight, in fact, it is night, um, we just got done watching the latest Democratic Party debate between Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton, and Martin O'Malley. That's right. <laughs> you got the name right. <laughs> yeah. He's still in the race. That's and right. if you don't know who we're talking about, you understand the questioning of the name and the statement. This also is the latest we've ever recorded, because we're in central time, so it is after 10 p.m., and we're old, so this is late for us now. Yeah, it is unfortunately safe to say we would both be in bed by now. <laughs> <laughs> so if we sound a little uh, haggard or sleepy drawl or something, that that is why. <laughs> Tony, I wanted to give you some highlights from the Republican debate before we begin talking about what we saw in the Democratic debate. Yeah, I'd love that. I I guess I, maybe we should quick start. I haven't watched a single debate yet, the Democratic ones, because uh, Sanders is the only candidate I actually care about in those, and the Republican ones, I uh, don't have the liver enough to make it a drinking game, so... So let me tell you some of the highlights from the Republican debate this week in Milwaukee, which is not far from where we live. First, both Trump and Carson said that wages are too high in America. I was surprised that anyone on a stage would say that who's trying to run for president. I'm not surprised that they think it, because they are part more more so of the employing class than the employed class, or to use the Marxist terms, they are the bourgeoisie, not the proletariat. And of course the bourgeoisie always wants lower wages. So I'm not surprised they think it. I'm surprised that they were willing to say it. Yeah, because a good bit of Republican supporters are rural voters and Generally, that means agriculture, and agriculture ain't a booming business for making money. The They both said it during a question about a $15 an hour minimum wage, but they didn't specifically say that wages only for minimum wage workers need to be lower. What they both said was, wages need to be lower, or wages are too high. Does that also correlate to Profits are not high enough. Probably. <laughs> if you lower wages, profits will increase. Well, unless you sell to people who no longer buy because you've lowered their wages. Yeah. Another highlight. Rand Paul said that he would fix inequality. He said that <laughs> inequality was a problem, which I was surprised to see. He had a chance to defend inequality to say how great inequality was, and he didn't do that. He said it was a problem. And here is how he's going to fix it. He is going to raise interest rates. Like federal interest rates? Like the Fed? Yes. He's, okay. he's concerned that the Fed is artificially keeping interest rates too low. Now, here's what the real world is. In the real world, people that are poor tend to have debt 
and the people who are rich are the people that hold that debt and collect interest on that debt. So in the real world, raising interest rates actually is going to make inequality worse. But that's his plan. Okay, let's hit this from a capitalist economic standpoint, because this darkens back to way too many of my classes I've taken. One, the President of the United States has zero influence over what the uh, Fed has for the interest rate. The Fed isn't even actually part of the federal government. It's composed of portions of the government and portions not of the government. It's technically its own private entity. The President of the United States can't can literally do nothing to influence the rates of the Fed aside from tanking the economy on purpose or something like that. Two, the entire world is la warning the Fed, other than the Fed, about their possibility of raising their interest rates from slightly above zero to about 1%, which is much lower than it has been, because a lot of people are are very concerned that the Fed doing that will tank the economy. And uh, I don't know. The federal rate is actually sort of more of a symbolic thing. It doesn't really exactly matter to that. And the way things are right now are really, really weird looking at it from a capitalist standpoint. But raising them, just like, nope, I'm going to raise them, is a bad idea. Like, I'm not a the biggest fan of the Fed or the way they do things, because of course they're working to preserve capitalism, but like if you look at it from just a capitalist econ economist standpoint, they have good reasons for not doing that. And I'd say maybe in general, uh, you know, it wouldn't be good to push them because we don't really want another recession or a depression. Since, you know, Europe's a little weak now. So that, that just seems like a terrible idea all around. And implausible. But, I, boy, yeah, that just doesn't send to any analysis, does it? Another thing <laughs> in the Republican debate was something interesting that a moderator said. There was a few times a moderator mentioned that the debate was on the topic of business. But all of the questions, I would have said, are about the economy. It struck me that perhaps to the Fox News moderators, there was no distinction between business and the economy. Yeah, no, I believe that. Um, it's kind of like my degree that I'm working on. I'm getting a degree in economics, and there's a degree in business that's Almost, it's very similar, except I'm not getting a business degree, technically. I'm just getting a regular degree. But the difference is what people call practical, applied, and theoretical. And, yeah, it doesn't surprise me that they would confuse the two. That's all I have to say about the Republican debate. Let's move on to the Democratic debate. I will say, right off the bat... I was, I mean, the moderators, the moderator, I don't know, there were a few other people, they didn't exactly explain the roles of everybody, there was one guy who was clearly asking the majority of the questions, and then there were three other people who seemed to also be asking questions, I'm not sure if they were like sub or co-moderator, whatever, I guess it's not important, there were other people there, but... I was... they were lo they were local Iowans. I don't know. Oh, were they? Yeah, were they local? Okay, local yeah, reporters. They mentioned it very briefly. Okay, so they were like local news people. Okay, that makes sense. Or probably people from their affiliate station. I actually was impressed that they asked some actual questions, and like once or maybe twice, even was went so far as to say you didn't answer the question I asked mm -hmm. only once or twice and they didn't push it beyond that even though they still didn't answer the question afterwards. I think that was Clinton is the one I'm remembering. I think there was another one but I can't remember for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I, I thought the moderator was probably the best moderator that we've seen so far. Yeah, so that's nice to see actual 
<laughs> basic level of doing your job. Oh, I'll also say, I don't know if it was because we were watching it uh, over the internet. I'm guessing it was like this, even if you watch the live broadcast, and maybe to a lesser extent. But at the bottom, they kept showing for us, like, who's being tweeted about the most? And on the side, they were showing tweets. And I was really confused, one, that a good bit of the tweets were about from Republican candidates, Mike Huckabee and Donald Trump specifically, which uh, I don't even know. I don't don't know why they would bother to show any of that stuff. It was nonsense, of course. And the other things I noticed was it was people who either were in the Obama administration with Clinton, in Bill Clinton's administration, or Bill Clinton himself being shown in support of Hillary. Yep. It was... Very obviously and heavily biased towards her. Yep. I think we need to have a whole section of the discussion underneath the umbrella of this debate and, and, and the people that put it together. We're trying very hard to make this a win for Hillary. A- yeah. And she had some good moments, but I don't think it was a clear win for her at the end, even though the establishment Repub- or the establishment Democratic Party, was trying very hard to make it so. One example you gave was who they chose to show the tweets from. Another example, the sound bites at the very beginning when they have their little special spiels. Yeah, they gave two sound bites to Hillary, one sound bite to O'Malley, and one to Sanders. And the Sanders one was about... Hillary's emails, which is widely regarded as one of the nicest things that he said about Hillary. So clearly, whoever was picking those sound bites for the like little splash at the beginning was strongly pushing for Hillary. I think about that sound bite, you could not only say it was one of the nicest things he said, but in the history of politics and presidential debates in the United States, it's probably the nicest thing anybody said. Because, and that gets to something else, I was a little confused as to whether or not I was watching a debate or a prize fight. They really pitched it like a boxing match. And they also, since we were watching and on the internet, had these people from the, the spin room, I think they called it. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Who were again commenting on it, like the very first thing they were like, they're like, oh, they're not swinging hard enough. It was weird <laughs> to say. You know, I have one other thing on the topic of setting up this debate for Hillary, and that is that the topic switch to include terrorism. Yeah. As a Secretary of State and and all of that, it's clearly one of Hillary's strong top areas. Now, with the recent attack in Paris, it's not completely out of the blue that they switched the topic, but it was interesting that a last minute switch that was made to the debate favored Clinton. Yeah, cuz she's pretty hawkish, I think is the term they normally use, although I'm not I'm sure why. I don't know much about Hawks, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> um, but uh, she is like, she thinks Obama is a little weak on his foreign policy, which is terrifying because he kills a lot of people, a lot of innocent people. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's terrifying that she thinks that's not enough. Uh, so, yeah, that definitely plays in her favor. One, I'm sorry. I said that the last one was the last thing I had to say, but I've got one more. Is it the last, last one? Yes. Another thing about this debate that favors Hillary is the fewer people that watch it, the better for Hillary. Yeah. The assumption is that the election is hers to lose, or at least I should say the nomination is hers to lose. She's got it. Maybe one of the other two can take it from her. And well, one. Yeah. O'Malley has no chance. <laughs> I'm sorry if you're a, a O'Malley fan. Um, 
let us know if you're an O'Malley fan because I have a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's Sanders or Clinton favoring Clinton, unfortunately. But the timing of the debate is Saturday night. Most people have other things they want to do on Saturday night. In fact, I think it was Salon put out a nice piece on this to show that Saturday night is almost the worst night. Friday is actually the absolute worst night to host a debate. In other words... It's the way to get the fewest people watching. And it's no surprise that uh, it's believed that the fewer people that watch, the better for Hillary. Because when people find out about Sanders, more and more people tend to like him. Okay, I do have one other structural thing about the debate. They had rules that they set up in the beginning. And I think it was basically, if you're asked a question, you have six. 60 seconds, if somebody says something about you, you have 30 seconds to respond. They largely didn't follow this. You could basically just chime in whenever you wanted, with the very strong exception as to when a commercial was supposed to, was scheduled. They didn't care at all if people, like, just started talking when it was kind of quiet. They just, yeah, whatever. They only jumped in if people were trying to talk over each other. Except when there was a commercial break. They were like, nope, 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 commercial. You know, it's very interesting because there was a moment, actually I think twice in the Republican debate, where the music came in. The music that always comes in before the commercial. So it felt like they were going into commercial, but the person talking said something so juicy. And then they had to have the like person they attacked respond to it that they didn't go to commercial. Wow. Yeah. So th- there, th- there's an interesting difference there. They probably just squeezed in more commercials later. But the I noticed that happen in the Republican debate. It might also be because I think both times it was Martin O'Malley. Yeah, yeah. The <laughs> only time that a commercial is coming up is when O'Malley wants to speak. Yeah. Oh, Martin O'Malley, how do you respond to this question? Oh, after this commercial break. <laughs> This kind of falls into your structural things a little bit. During the commercials, we watched online. Uh, so we didn't see commercials, but we saw, like, scrolling updates about the attack in Paris. This just reminds me of, like, the post-9-11 world where it seemed like the news was always trying to scare you about terrorism. I haven't felt that way. Maybe it's because I don't watch as much news, but I haven't felt that way in a long time. I felt that way tonight. I kept thinking, why do they keep trying to skip? Like, they don't have anything new. It's the same updates there were ten minutes ago, so why are you telling me all about it again? Keep your anxiety at the highest pitch. Yeah. The first topic that I talked about was about terrorism, because obviously, the recent attacks in Paris... Uh, so they, they switched up. I don't know what topic was supposed to be the lead, but they switched it to terrorism. And I thought it was interesting. Clinton, you know, I know they have a team of people who work with them for all sorts of stuff. Sound bites, making sure you hit this and that, doing research and whatnot. In the, I don't know, 10 minutes they talked about, 10, 15 minutes they, they covered this topic. Um, Clinton spoke a couple times, maybe five minutes at most. She said jihadi or jihadist uh, six times. And I didn't start tallying until after the first few, so we'll go with at least six times. It could have been a couple more than that. And I was really bothered on the topic of terrorism. It reminded me of Rudy Giuliani, actually. Which, by the way, I think you can still donate to his... 2008 political uh, Republican campaign on his website. Um, I'm I'm pretty sure last last I'd heard you could still donate to him. So you know he might still win it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she was asked. Uh, oh, uh, she was attacked by uh, Bernie Sanders about taking uh, donations from big Wall Street banks. Which if you you know, you go look up and see, yes, they're like her leading backers. And her response was 9-11. <laughs> September 11th happened, and damn it, she was there, and 
it was on Wall Street, and therefore Wall Street bankers donate to her? Yeah, she was just trying to bring up as much terrorism-related material as she could, regardless of whether the question had anything to do with it. Yeah. That was not the only time. She also talked about uh, Crisis. getting, o- getting uh, Osama bin Laden uh, for some question that really had it, nothing it was, to do with it. It was what that. was your, like your biggest crisis thing yeah. is in the position. And my thought, of course, which I, I really think would have played to her, would have to make her look human and to really make her relatable and make her a sympathetic character. She should have said when her husband cheated on her and every, literally everyone around the world knew about it. Like, that is something that humanizes her, somebody who can seem sort of out of touch and unpersonable. It's a painful moment. It makes you feel for her and about her. And that, re- you know, and talking about, like, how do you move on from such a terrible thing? Like, how do you choose to stay with someone? Like, like how do you, like, that is a compelling human story but instead she talked about sitting well uh, in the room while Obama was like yes we should of course kill Osama bin Laden because this is been the United States' goal since September 11th yeah her answer was a little bit bizarre I feel like she said we had to decide if we wanted to get Osama bin Laden and we made the tough choice we decided yes it's like okay yeah, I like she tried to make it sound like they weren't sure if it was him or not, except it sounded like from things I remember from around the time that they were incredibly sure it was him. Like I think they even had like the exact height of him due to like his frequency of walks and like shadows and stuff like that. Like, I, uh, whatever. Uh, yeah, it was confusing and out of left field. And, like, she could have said Benghazi, too. Like, that's another thing. Like, Republicans like to hit her about that. I'm guessing she's trying to avoid it. But she could have been, like, you know, losing a diplomat as Secretary of State. This is a terrible thing. I, there's nothing you can do when you're so far away. You just wish that, you know. Maybe that's my biggest critique of her is that she doesn't seem like she has a soul. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, like, she... She's very, like, she's not a horrible human being or anything, but she's like uh, all business, and that's it. I think she's kind of doubling down on this almost Margaret Thatcher-esque, like, really tough lady kind of uh, image. Oh, yeah, 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 I can see that. Can we talk Obamacare? Yes. Let's talk about, or... The Affordable Care Act. It's okay to call it Obamacare. Obama calls it that now. Yeah, I I do think that's interesting. I think it it think probably because it's be to the point where the Republicans are so going after it in such a, a comical esque thing that it's almost a, a point of honor. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing in the name Obamacare that's inherently negative, so you might as well claim it. Like, yeah. it's actually going to make it more famous, probably. Yeah. Anyway, there was a small bit of the discussion about Obamacare. This is what I think is interesting. Basically, Obamacare was a bunch of regulation. And turns out, when you try to regulate an industry... That industry tries to find ways around that regulation to recoup or even increase their profits greater than what you originally had. Well, hold on, hold on. Are you saying corporations want profit? That's right. And they'll do whatever they can within legal and sometimes possibly illegal means to get that? Yeah. And the question that was asked in the debate was about, about the propagation of high deductible plans. In other words, insurance companies don't cover you as much as they used to. They used to cover more of the stay. Now you've got to pay 1000 2000 5000 10000 whatever. You have to pay a big chunk of your your uh health care whenever you you actually have to use it. 
But boy, at least I got that health care that I still can't afford. So, here's the thing with Obamacare. From the Marxist perspective, it is no surprise, and should be no surprise, that corporations are going to do this. That every time we impose a regulation, they're just going to find another way to go around it, or use lobbyists to try to undo it, or whatever. The answer to providing good health care, instead of passing regulations and hoping that private insurance or private health care doesn't find a way around it, you know, we could do that, continue to pass more regulations and hope that they don't find a way around it, or we could just have a health care program that covers everyone. The government can sit back and make rules and hope those rules work, or the government can take over and do what needs to be done. Yeah. You know, I guess it's too scary to say the government should take over and do it, but Medicare is extremely popular. There's, Works well. There's problems with it. There's some holes. But its costs compared to coverage are way better than any private insurance that we have. Yeah, I'm on, um, is it Medicare? Okay. I'm good at remembering things. I'm, I'm on the Medicare because I am poor and we, me and my wife have kids and we cannot afford insurance and we are not given any insurance through our works or works, our places of employment. And yeah, it costs us nothing and I haven't had any issues. Like, um, I've been sick for about a month, and, you know, I was worried I had strep, and I called, and I came in, they did strep test, and, you know, I didn't, but, yeah, no problem. You know, like, it, just like your normal everything, except, uh, I don't have to pay anything at the moment, because we just make so little, so, yeah. I've not had any problem. Or the biggest issue with it, I'll say, is that every year or sometimes slightly more often, we have to give proof of how much money we make and things like that. And like if we move or if we get a raise, we have to do it. So sometimes we'll have to do it and then do it and then do it. But these aren't things that you'd have to do on a single payer system because they wouldn't be constantly trying to kick you off for as any reason they can. <laughs> and I guarantee you that what the government is paying to cover your costs is far less than what any private insurance is going to charge you to cover your costs. Yeah. I, I think it's interesting. Um, when my wife got pregnant the first time, we weren't on the the Badger Care, which is the the Medicare for us in Wisconsin, um, and I didn't have insurance at the time then, and they needed to get a sample of my blood to do some genetic looking at stuff. I have weird genetic things uh, that they know about, so they wanted to go ahead and look at that. Um, she was covered under it because she was pregnant, and pregnant women are covered. Um, <laughs> the like, you know, they normally charge, like, insurance companies, I don't remember what they said it was, but, like, they were just going to charge me, like, $15, because it's a lower rate if you're uninsured, which blew my mind, because that's insane, that they're like, oh, you don't have anybody to help you pay for this? Well, therefore, we will just charge you a reasonable amount of money, although $15 for a vial of blood seems like a lot, but... There was a moment in the debate that I liked... Hillary Clinton said that she would tax the rich, and I felt when I, and I saw when she said that, that it pained her to say that. I think it was something that she didn't want to have to say, but in order to compete with Sanders, she's had to say a bunch of things that I don't think she would have said otherwise. Yeah, I think that's a kind of a good characteristic of a lot of the things she said, um, I don't pay a huge amount of attention to Hillary, but we saw Sanders speak a few months ago now, 
And his messaging was more or less the same. That is what we saw. And from what little I've paid attention to Hillary, her messaging is pretty radically different from what she had been doing. Like, I, I think that's a very interesting differentiation is that he's basically just sticking to his guns, which is largely domestic policy and specifically income inequality in the economy. Um, and those are, I think, probably definitely places to start for things. And she's had to move from her stances previously to go further towards at least making lip service uh, to some actual change, which I think it's pretty safe to say if Hillary Clinton is elected president and the Democrats control 100% of the seats and everything and, like, the Supreme Court will pledge a blood oath that they will always vote in favor of any law she passes, she won't do anything about uh, taxing the rich. Or if she does, it'll be within 5% of what it is now. Yeah. She, Hillary Clinton, I think, will prove to be a very moderate leader. Right. And, so... and I think that's what she is quietly trying to sell herself as. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Another part of the debate that I was happy to see was an extended discussion on campaign finance. Who's paying for each of the candidates' campaigns? Who's using super PACs? Who's too close with Wall Street? Yeah. And I think maybe I should say here, um, it was probably very obnoxious to read. Uh, but I yell at the TV a lot. <laughs> That's probably an understatement. I, I yell a lot at the TV when I watch TV, which is why I don't watch a lot of TV. Um, and in particular, I was watching a lot at this, and Hillary Clinton was talking about... Hillary Clinton was saying that she wasn't all for the banks because she thought the banks should be punished when they don't play by the rules. And I was screaming at the TV, but they were playing by the rules. They didn't do anything illegal. And then Sanders rebuttals with, they didn't do anything wrong. They did play by the rules. And that made me very happy. It was a very exciting moment where Tony yelled at the TV, <laughs> the TV. to correct Hillary Clinton's lie, essentially, and then Sanders said the exact same thing that you said, which was wonderful. Yeah. That all my scream at the TV paid off once. <laughs> <laughs> he must have heard you. Yeah. Who didn't? <laughs> you know, in the first Democratic debate, I thought one of the weakest moments for Hillary was when she tried to answer what she would do about the big banks. And she literally said that she went to Wall Street and said, you cut that out. Which <laughs> did not make her sound like a strong leader or anyone who would seriously take on Wall Street in any capacity. A mildly irritated mother, perhaps. Yes. I mean, it was comical. <laughs> and she did not mess up so bad tonight. She was a little bit more professional sounding. But... I think all you really need to say is 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 the thing that Sanders said is Wall Street pays for your campaign and they don't do that because they don't think they're getting anything. They do that for a reason. Yeah. Um and on the Wall Street for a reason. So Glass Steagall came up quite a bit. And for those who don't know, Glass Steagall was the law that was passed after the uh depression. Or maybe during the Depression. Well, after the economy tanked uh, during the Depression era to separate investment banks and savings banks. That way, banks couldn't take the savings of a bunch of people and invest them however they felt like to try and make money off of that. That's pretty common sense. And that was repealed by Bill Clinton with the cheerings from the Fed chairman... Uh, Alan Greenspan, who is a libertarian. 
so it's not too surprising that Hillary Clinton was the only candidate who was not in favor of reinstating Glass-Steagall, saying something like it wouldn't fix anything with the exception of the fact that she's ignoring. It would have definitely prevented the crisis that we most recently had in the way it happened. It probably, it won't prevent all crises, but it's a good step to making it so that the government isn't on sort of the hook, as they like to say, for paying for it. Because otherwise, if it's just an investment bank messing around with questionable investments, if they go under, they go under. But the problem that they could be mixed is that everything was backed on mortgages and mortgages affect regular people. And it was then dumbly distributed everywhere. But, like, basically, it was because they took the savings of everybody and gambled. It's like, if you worked at work and you were somehow allowed, or at your job, you are somehow allowed to take all the money out of the till in the safe and then go to the casino and gamble on it. And if you accidentally lost all of that money, somebody would just come and replace it all for you. I mean, you have nothing. You literally have nothing to lose, and only things to gain. One of the things that came up in tonight's debate was how people would staff their cabinets, not in detail, but mainly in relation to the Wall Street question. Would you have Wall Street establishment folks in your cabinet? I thought that was very interesting. I don't think that ever came up four years ago or eight years ago. Or with the Republicans, because the answer would be, well, why wouldn't you? Mm-hmm. So I would thought it was very interesting that essentially the, the candidates were put in a position where the strongest answer was, I will not put a Wall Street establishment person in my cabinet. Yeah. I can't remember if Clinton actually said that or not. I think she spouted to, I don't even remember. Yeah. But I wanted to ask you, how cool would it be if Bernie was the nominee, was the president, and appointed Janos Varoufakis as part of his cabinet? Do you have to be a U.S. citizen to be part of the cabinet? I don't know. Let's say not for this. If not, or I mean... <laughs> Yeah, I only wonder because that's part of the order of succession for president. <laughs> and he obviously wouldn't be eligible to be president. No. You can't be president if you're not a citizen. He's a Greek citizen. Um, That would be phenomenal. I don't think uh, Bernie is that radical, unfortunately. No. Um, But boy, uh, he would be my pick. Because, yeah, that guy's amazing. I'm so sad he's not part of uh, the government anymore. But then again, uh, in Greece. But then again, it's probably good for him that he's not part of that government anymore. You know, I have another Hashtag question. Hashtag sellout. <laughs> Sellouts, I should say. I have another question for you, Tony. Yeah. Are you more socialist than Eisenhower? Yeah, obviously. <laughs> that was That was a little... I, I'm a little concerned about that because he made the Bernie Sanders, I guess we should say, made a comment that he, because he was asked about what tax rate he would, uh, what he would charge the rich for taxes, and he unfortunately he wouldn't give an actual like number. He said like higher than it is now, but then he said not as high as, uh. Eisenhower had it at 90%. I'm not as much of a socialist as he was. Which is an amusing sound bit. But it worries me if he's backpedaling a bit on this no, I'm a democratic socialist thing. Like, is does this mean he's trying to give himself a distance from the word socialist? Because if so... I'm concerned because, one, I don't think that plays to his strengths. And, two, he's been pretty firm on that, and backing off now would be weird. I mean, it could just be a funny quip, 
I, and that that's an amusing quip then, and I'm fine with that. But. I think it's more than that. I think what he's doing with that is an attempt to normalize the term. Oh, okay. Take a mainstream guy, say, this guy was basically a big old socialist, and I'm pretty close, maybe not so far. And so I think that was part of his, his normal deal, because one of his, his normal kind of talking points is, yeah, I'm a socialist, and I really don't think it's that weird. Yeah. And I don't know if it came off that way. I think what needed to happen for it to come off that way was more questions about him being a socialist, which we didn't see in this debate, which I thought, thought was really interesting. No, because it's not focused on Hillary then. If the question was like, how do you think Hillary benefits from not being a dirty socialist like you, then maybe, but... Yeah. I think that socialism is actually quite popular. I would love to see a question coming up to say something like, what is your stance on capitalism? Oh, that'd be great. Although, Martin O'Malley basically gave that answer, and I think his answer was, I love capitalism, God bless capitalism, nobody touch my capitalism. Yes, yes. <laughs> For a moment, he turned into a libertarian who says, the thing we have now isn't capitalism. Capitalism is this wonderful version of the thing that we have now without its problems. That's what I support. Yeah. Oh, well, it's a good thing he's not going to win. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I apologize to any O'Malley supporters. That's it for my notes. What do you have left? <clears throat> All right. I have just a couple things, uh, sort of little side notes. Uh, one is that something that I wish would be highlighted more. Um, so there was a vote on, I don't even remember what they're calling it anymore. It was like SIPA, then it was like CISPA, or something. It's this internet-like surveillance thing. Um, Rand Paul, a Republican, has really been harping about how this is such a terrible, terrible thing. And it needs to be defeated. Well, this was voted on a couple of weeks ago. Um, none of the Republican candidates who are in Congress or Senate showed up, including... Rand Paul, who's like made this a like part, a pillar of his campaign. Uh, and I will say it's not uncommon for people who are running for president to not show up to do their jobs. Uh, anybody who lives here in Wisconsin is well aware that Scott Walker uh, traveled around on the dime of the Koch brothers and the Wisconsin taxpayer uh, and was nary uh, to be found here. Bernie Sanders showed up to vote against it. Bernie Sanders also last week introduced uh, legislation to make uh, remove marijuana from the federal like drug list thing so that states who legalize it, you don't get the problem where the federal government can still go and bus these dispensaries and other such things. Um... He's still doing his job, and I know that sounds kind of like a mild thing, but when uh, Obama and McCain were running for president, both of them, the financial crash happened, and they made the biggest showing of that they were going to stop worrying about their campaign and go continue campaigning but making it look like they're doing work to go, uh, that's not how they phrase it, but, you know, to go and deal with this financial problem, mm -hmm. which Obama showed up and was much more competent looking, which basically put the nail in uh, McCain's coffin. But they made it a huge deal that they were going to actually do the job they were being paid to do and not just keep running for president. And Sanders has been consistently going back to make sure he goes to votes, committee meetings, and putting forth legislation, I really feel like that needs to be highlighted. Because that's very rare, which is terrifying. Because I don't know if people are aware, but senators and congresspeople make a huge amount of money. Like, they are very well paid for the little they do. Um, yeah, I just think he should be highlighted that for that. The last little note I have is... 
again, sort of tied back, not necessarily into the Wall Street stuff, but just the Hillary Clinton her relationship with corporations. Because, you know, people have their closing statements, and of course in their closing statements, people say, like, oh, I want to thank my wife, my blah, 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 blah. Uh, Hillary Clinton's first thing was she wanted to thank CBS. She was the only one who thanks the, I think both Sanders and O'Malley thanked, like, the people who watched and were there or something like that, the place that was hosting them. But Hillary Clinton made sure she thanked the corporations before friends or family or supporters. And I think that's really the most telling thing about her. Like, if you need to know one thing, it's that she feels that the corporations are to be thanked before anyone else. I think what's interesting to me is that that was the standard for a long time. You know, in previous debates, people always thanked the corporation hosting it, and you'd get that, you'd get it down the line, every candidate doing that. Well, I think what's different now is that we have some that don't. Yeah. Yeah, that could be. Which points, I mean, it doesn't mean that, yeah. Hillary is the establishment candidate. Oh, yeah, very clearly. And that the media establishment was doing about everything they can to make sure they knew that Hillary was one like, ugh, man. Actually, I wonder, because, like, the the stuff on the side and the bottom was sponsored by Twitter, which is weird that they paid to provide information, but whatever. They don't want to get their name out there in case you haven't heard of Twitter and consume media. Uh, I guess I don't know what their advertising strategy is. But uh, I want to look and see who Twitter donates to if they donate to any of the candidates. Because I also wonder if it was Twitter, I would guess, and not uh, CBS or whoever it was who was sponsoring, who was filtering the ones that get put up there. I am going to be a grumpy person right now, but I absolutely hated that there was a Twitter feed on the side of the screen the whole night. Oh, yeah, it's obnoxious. It's distracting. What do you watch? Um, do you watch a lot of like? Uh, twenty-four hour news networks. None. I uh, I catch them. Unfortunately, sometimes the uh, business building I work in on campus. I used has to see a them in giant screen. I used to see them in airports. So I have seen them recently. I can't say that I actively watched them in airports, though. Right, but I mean, like that's all it is. Is like there's like the the two inch by two inch little box where the people are actually talking and then all the rest is just nonsense. I think it's good to bring in what people are saying to democratize the ability, you know, to say anyone can tweet this and then anyone can read anyone else's tweet. I think that's a wonderful thing. Yeah. To say what Donald Trump said about the debate, I don't care. That I yeah. mean, you don't need to invent a new piece of software so that Donald Trump can get his opinion out there. He's he can do that anyway. That's not kind of the point of Twitter from my or at least not what the point of Twitter should be in my perspective. Yeah, they very much undercut themselves, because at the beginning, I think they said, join our conversation by using the hashtag, whatever. Um, so yeah, they very, and it started out where it was just mostly normal people, but they, yeah, pretty quickly undercut themselves. When one, the most of what they put up, because like, you have somebody filtering this, was people quoting what was going on, or people being like, now we're talking about this on the debate. So, there's pretty little opinion anyway. Yeah. And then, about 60 to 70% was established political figures. And there was only, I would say, a handful of tweets that they showed that were actual people, unless it's somebody who's some sort of media person I don't know, who actually had an opinion or a view, or a comment. Yeah, like, it was a minority of the tweets they showed, for sure. What they wanted to show you was, 
here's what the political establishment thinks. They're going to tell you what you should think. And here are tweets from regular people that are just direct quotes from the moderator or one of the candidates. In other words, if you're watching it, why would you put that on there? That is literally no new information. But man, you just saw that now it's on Twitter, but then you saw it, man. It's like, what? Instant nostalgia. Hey, remember that time three seconds ago when, when I Hillary went, said X, Y, Z? Marxism Today is created by Red Wagner and Tony Schmidt and is a project of the Democratic Socialists of America, Madison, Wisconsin chapter. We are not official spokespeople of the DSA and the views expressed in this podcast are our own. You can find us on Twitter at Red Wagner 2, that's the number 2, and Schmidt AJ, that's S-C-H-M-I-T-T-A-J. Our episodes are all available for download on our blog, marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com. You can share your thoughts about this episode and others on our subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash marxismtoday. Also, you can find information about the Democratic Socialists of America Madison chapter on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash DSA Madison. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.